Hello and welcome to a Monkey Logic design tutorial. I'm Michael and today I'm going to show you how to build a per slide progress bar in Adobe Captivate. Before we start building a progress bar, let's take a look at how published Captivate files convey time. This published project has three slides. The first slide is 7 seconds and slide 2 and 3 are 2 minutes long. The project total length and time elapsed are located in the lower left corner with the time elapsed on the left and the project total length on the right. In the middle of the play bar at the bottom is the progress bar. As the project plays, the progress bar moves to the right to show you where you are in relation to the entire project. I'm going to press play to start the project. Because the project is 4 minutes and 7 seconds long and the first slide is only 7 seconds, the progress bar doesn't move very much. Looking at the time elapsed in the lower left corner, we see that we're only at 5 seconds. I'm going to press the next button to advance to slide 2 and the progress bar starts moving again. If I click in the middle of the progress bar, which jumps the project forward in time, we have no immediate way of knowing exactly how much time we've spent on slide 2, nor how much longer the slide lasts. The time elapsed does show the total time we've spent in the project, as does the play bar to a certain extent, but we have nothing to give us any information about this specific slide. Shorter slides, like slide 1, aren't that bad because we know they're short, but when you have a lot of slides in your project, there is no easy way to discern how long you've been on a slide, nor how much time is remaining. Now I'm going to show you what we're going to build. On the bottom of this slide is a red circle moving to the right along a red line. The circle's location on the red line is directly related to the length of this slide. When the red circle reaches the end of the line, it means we've reached the end of the slide. I can grab the play bar to scrub the timeline, and you can see that the red circle moves back and forth in sync with the play bar. I set up the buttons in the upper right corner of the slide just to give me quick access to the three types of progress bars I'm going to build along with the two variations. Going back to the beginning of the slide, that'll start playing again. The circle moving along the line is the first progress bar I'm going to build along with a slight variation where I use an image instead of a circle. Then I'm going to build this masked sliding smart shape, which is visually similar to how Captivate's play bars appear and the variation of it, which also uses an image. Finally, I'm going to build another masked sliding smart shape, which incorporates space for buttons to the left and right of the mask. Before I get into the tutorial, I want to address that you won't be able to use these methods to scrub the timeline. Each method uses smart shapes and images to simulate the progression of time for each slide, so anyone viewing your published project won't have the ability to grab the progress bar to scrub through the published file. Now we can jump into Captivate and start building. I set up a template project containing three slides, with each slide assigned to one of three master slides. A vertical guide is placed at the center of the slides, which is going to help us with positioning later on, and a horizontal guide is placed near the bottom of the slide. The horizontal guide is marking off the area at the bottom where I want my progress bars to live. The horizontal guide is a constant reminder of the progress bar area and not to place anything below it. Going over to the master slides, the first master slide only has an image as the background. The second master slide has the same image, but it's pulled up a little bit so it's resting right on that horizontal guide. And below that is a smart shape which is filled with a gradient. The third master slide is a duplicate of the second one, but it doesn't have the smart shape at the bottom. The first progress bar I'm going to create is the sliding circle smart shape. Going back to my first master slide, I'm going to go up, click on my shapes, Go to Line, come down into the progress bar area, left click, then hold Shift so I can constrain the line horizontally, and then drag out to the right. I want the line stroke to be red, which it already is, and the width to be 2. The line is still highlighted, so I can go up to my alignment buttons and click Center horizontally on the slide. If you don't have the Align tools visible, you can show them by going to Window and then clicking on Align. I want the line to be positioned horizontally between the guide and the bottom of the slide. To do that, I'm going to go over to my shapes, rectangle, and draw a rectangle in the play bar area. Then I'm going to hit control 4 so I can zoom in on that. I'm going to change the stroke width to 0. And it looks like I pretty much nailed it on the guide and the bottom of the slide, which is what I want. And then come over a little bit so I can see the line a little better. Because I already have the rectangle selected, I can hold the shift key and then click on the line to select it. Because the square was the first object I had already selected, 
Every object I then click on while holding Shift allows me to use the alignment tools to align anything to the initial shape I had selected. So I can click on the Align Middle button, and the line then gets centered on the rectangle, which also means it's centered between the guide and the bottom of the slide. I don't need the square anymore, so I can hold Control, click on the line, which deselects only it, and then press Delete to remove the square. I'm going to go back to my film strip, and then scroll back down so I can see the line again. For the progress indicator, I'm going to create that circle. So I'm going to go to Shapes, Oval, click, hold Shift so I can constrain the circle for both the X and the Y axis, then release, and I've got my circle. With the circle still selected, I'm going to change the fill color to red. The stroke, I want white, and it's already at two pixels. I want to position the progress indicator so it's centered on the left side of the stroke. And I could eyeball it, but it's easier if I change the fill opacity of the smart shape so I can see through it. So I'm going to go to the opacity menu, select 70, then drag it over here. And my guide is showing me that it's centered horizontally on the line. And then I can use my arrow keys to nudge it over. And since it's 70% opacity, I can see through it to visually see when it's centered on that line. Now I can change the opacity back to 100%. To make the indicator move, I'm going to go over to my timing tab, then go down to my effect menu, select motion path, and left to right. Let me scroll back down here. This creates an arrow on the center of the object, which indicates where the movement start position is. Scrolling over to the right, we'll find a square for the movement end position. I'm going to grab a hold of the square so I can move it. Hold shift to constrain the angle so it stays horizontal. And then drag and drop it on the right side of that line. Press control 1. I can zoom out. And I'm going to go ahead and uncheck show hide motion path just so we can get that out of the way. And then I'm going to expand my timeline. I'm going to change the duration of the smart shape by right-clicking on it in the timeline and selecting show for the rest of the slide. Click the little arrow so I can see my effect. Grab the end of that and drag it out to the end of the slide. Now I can drag my playhead and actually I'm going to click first to deselect everything. Grab my playhead, scrub it, and you can see that the smart shape moves along the path. When the playhead reaches the end of the timeline, it reaches the end of the line, which indicates the end of the slide. For a project where slides automatically move to the following slide, this would be fine, but I want to add next and back buttons. I prefer to use smart shapes as buttons primarily because they have more flexibility than standard buttons do. So I'm going to go up to Shapes, select my rounded rectangle tool, and just drag out a rectangle. I'm going to manually change the dimensions because I already know what size I want to make this. Since I'm already on the properties palette, I'm going to go to options, deselect constrained proportions so I can change these values without affecting the other one. I'm going to enter my width to 68 and my height is going to be 25. I also have styles already set up for these buttons. So I'm going to go to my style name and select back next buttons. Now I can double click on the smart shape. To get my text tool, type next, forward arrow, and select use as a button. Now I can go to my actions tab. When you use a smart shape as a button, the action will default to go to the next slide, which is what I want this button to do. I'm also going to turn on the hand cursor option. The cursor will then turn into a pointer icon when you mouse over the button on a computer. I'm going to go ahead and move this down into the play bar area. The guide is showing me there that it's centered horizontally with the line. Drop it into place. I also want a back button, and rather than setting up another smart shape, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this one by hitting Control D. Move it over here to the left side. Got my alignment guide popping up. Drop it right about there. I'm going to double click on the smart shape. Now I can change the text back. I'm going to go down in my timeline, right click on the smart shape that's highlighted, and select show for the rest of the slide. 
I don't want the back button to pause anything, so in my timing palette, I'm going to uncheck pause after. Finally, I'm going to move the next button so it rests at the very end of the slide. Because the next button pauses the slide 1.5 seconds before the end of the slide, because it displays for 3 seconds and pauses at 1.5 seconds, if I drag the playhead now, you can see that when we reach the point where the next button would pause the slide, the indicator won't be at the end of the line yet. So I have to adjust the effect duration so it ends where the next button pauses the slide. So I'm going to drag this back to the left a little bit, right there at that pause point. And now when I drag the playhead, you can see that the indicator is at the end of the line where the next button pauses the slide. This play bar is complete. But I'm going to show you another idea for taking this one step further. With some theme projects, I will extend the theme to the custom play bar as well. So I'm going to duplicate this slide by right clicking and selecting duplicate. I'm going to go into my library and I'm going to drag out Mortimer. Mortimer is the Monkey Logic Design mascot. I'm going to click on the circle to make that the target shape. Hold shift, click on Mortimer. And then I'm going to use Align Center and Align Middle, so he's centered over the circle. And then I'm going to go down to just select the circle in my timeline and hit Delete because I don't need it anymore. If I was going to position any image on my slide, I would then use the exact same concept as I did with the circle by changing the alpha, which you can do by, by highlighting an image, hitting Edit Image, and then reducing your alpha and then clicking OK. I'm going to zoom in on that, and you can see that you can see the line through him. I'm going to change that back to 100% again, because I don't want to see through him. I'm going to hit Control-1 to zoom out. Then I'm going to go ahead and add my timing back in. So I'm going to go to Timing, Effect drop-down, Motion Path, Left-Right. Scroll back down, grab my endpoint, hold Shift, and drag it over to the end of the line. Now I need to go down and change the duration of the object to show for the rest of the slide and adjust the left to right effect. So it ends also at that pause point. If you ever have trouble finding where your pause point is or you want to move something so it ends at a specific point, I recommend finding that point with your playhead first. And so I can see that this is now resting right on that next button pause, which would then make it very easy to locate where that point is in your timeline if you're zoomed out. Uncheck Show Hide Motion Path. Click to deselect everything. And when I scrub the timeline, Mortimer stops right where the next button pauses the slide. For the next example, I'm going to mimic how the Captivate Progress Bar functions. I'm going to go to slide 3, go into my library, and I'm going to drag out this mask image. I'm going to press Control 4 to zoom in on the image so you can get a better view of what it looks like. The image has a vertical gradient and a transparent hole in the middle. I'm going to create a smart shape that moves behind the mask so you can only see it through the hole in the mask. I'm going to grab the mask, position it at the bottom of the slide, and press Control 1 to zoom out. I'm going to right click on the mask and then select show for the rest of the slide. So now the image will be shown for the entire duration of the slide. For the progress bar, I'm going to go to shapes, rectangle. Then I'm going to drag out a shape that's slightly larger than the hole in the mask. In the properties panel, I'm going to change the fill from solid to gradient. And from my fill, I'm going to choose this custom gradient I've already set up, which is just a light red to darker red gradient. Now I'm going to change the stroke width to zero because I don't want this to have a stroke. And since this is going to move from the left to the right, I'm going to move it over to the left close to the end of the hole in that mask. And I'm going to hit control four so I can zoom in so I can get a better look at this. And I'm going to move it right about there. I want that to be about one to two pixels to the left of the hole in the mask. So I can hit Control-1 to zoom back out. I want this to be below the mask, so I'm going to grab it in my timeline and drag it down below. 
right click on it. I'm going to show it for the rest of the slide. Then I'm going to go back over to my timing, select motion path, and then left to right. When the smart shape moves to the right and it's centered on the slide, it will then fill up the hole in the mask. So I'm going to grab the end point, hold shift, and drag it to the center guide. Before I change the effect duration, and I'm going to go ahead and bring that out anyway, I want to add a back and a next button to the slide. Rather than creating another set of buttons, I'm going to copy them from slide one. So I'm going to come here, select the first one, hold shift, and then select the second one. So I've got them both. Hit control C to copy. Come back to this slide. Timeline's at the beginning, so I can hit control V to paste. Then I'm going to drag them both up so they are above the mask. Now I'll adjust the Smart Shapes effect duration so it ends where the next button pauses. And let's see, you should be about there. And with that still selected, I'm going to go ahead and uncheck Show Hide Motion Path because I don't want to see that so it's not distracting. Now when I grab the playhead, scrub the timeline, you can see that the smart shape moves and stops at the same position where the next button pauses, indicating the duration of the slide. Just like the image variation for the first slide, we can also use an image for the play bar in this setup. I'm going to right click on the slide, duplicate again, and then I'm going to go into my library and drag out this slider grass image. This could be used as part of a training for a lawn maintenance company. I'm going to right click on the image, select show for the rest of the slide, and then I'm going to select the smart shape, hold shift, click on the image. I want this to be centered with the smart shape, so I'm going to hit align middle, but I want it to be at the same position on the right, so I'm going to hit align right. I don't need the smart shape anymore, so I can select the smart shape in the timeline, hit delete, select the image again, go back to my timing tab, select motion path, left to right, scroll down, and then grab that end point again, hold shift, and drop it on the vertical guide. Now I need to put this behind the mask, so I'm going to drag it down, open up the effect, then drag it over here to eight and a half seconds. I'm going to deselect the show hide motion path again, click to deselect everything, and now when I scrub the play bar, I have an image indicating the passage of time. For the final play bar, I'm going to use another mask, but I'm also going to place the back and next buttons in the play bar area, which is something you can't do with this play bar setup. When I'm setting up trainings in Captivate, I like to have a light colored placeholder for the next button on slide, so when the next button actually appears, it creates the effect that the button has gone from an inactive to an active state. The downside of setting up files this way is then you would be dealing with three objects on each slide, the back button, the pseudo next button, and the actual next button. But by placing the back button and pseudo next button on a master slide, the only navigation button you have to set up on each main slide is the next button. I'm going to go back to slide one. I'm going to select the back and the next button again. copy them, go to my master slides, and I'm going to select my third master slide, and then I'm going to paste them here. I'm going to hold control and then click on the back button to deselect it, which leaves the next button selected. I'm going to deselect uses a button because it's just going to serve as a visual placeholder. Then I'm going to change the style name to back next inactive, which is a style I've already got set up for this. Then I can move back to my film strip. I'm going to go to my last slide. Scroll down a little bit, paste the buttons again. Then I'm going to hit control, click on next, because I don't want the next button highlighted. The back button highlighted now, I'm going to hit delete to remove it. Come down here to my timeline, and as I hide the next button and then show it, you can see how the pseudo next button gives the appearance of an inactive button. And when the entrance of the actual next button occurs, it makes it appear that that next button has actually become active. I'm going to go into my library's palette, and I'm going to grab another mask and place it on the slide. 
It's set up the exact same way as the previous mask, but it's just not as wide as the other one. We scroll down, place this at the bottom of the slide. Center on the slide using the center horizontally on slide button and change the duration to rest of slide. I'm gonna press control four to zoom in on it and then scroll over here to the left side of the mask. For the play bar indicator for this one, I'm gonna go up to shapes, select rectangle, and draw out a shape that's taller than the hole in the mask. I'm gonna change the fill to gradient. I'm gonna select the same custom red gradient I did before. Change the stroke width to zero. Finally, right click on the smart shape and show for rest of slide. Moving to the options tab, you can see the width and height of the shape. I'm going to uncheck constrained proportions so I can change the width to six pixels. Then I'm gonna position this also just to the right of the hole in the mask. I'm gonna go back to my timing palette, scroll back down so I can see it again. Instead of using the motion path first, I'm gonna go ahead and select scale two as my effect. And then I'm going to set the effect duration to 8.5 seconds, which is where I know the next button will pause the slide. The scale to effect allows you to set a multiplier for the X and the Y values of an object size over the duration of the effect. The default X and Y values for the effect are both set to two, which means that the smart shape will be twice as tall and twice as wide when the effect ends. If the smart shape was 20 pixels wide and I set the scale X to eight, the smart shape would be 160 pixels wide. Or if I set the scale X to 0.5, which would be half, the smart shape would be 10 pixels wide. I set the width of the smart shape I created to six pixels because I want it to become 600 pixels wide at the end of the effect. So I'm going to change the scale X to 100. And because I don't want the height to change, I'm going to change the scale Y to one. If I scrub the timeline now, you can see that the smart shape is increasing in size horizontally. Unfortunately, I only want it to expand out to the right, but scale two doesn't have reference points such as from the left, from the top, or from the lower right. So the scaling always occurs from the center of the object. The good news is that also by adding the left to right motion path, we can make it appear that the smart shape is only expanding to the right. So in the timing palette, I'm gonna hit the plus icon to add an effect. Select motion path from my list and then left to right. Scroll over to the right so we can find the end of the motion path. I'm gonna hold shift and position it on the center guide. Then I'm gonna set the duration to 8.5 seconds. Expand that down so we can see they're both at 8.5 and then hit control one to zoom out. Scroll over and then I'm gonna uncheck show hide motion path. Now when I scrub the timeline, it looks like the smart shape is only expanding out to the right. The reason is because even though the smart shape is simultaneously expanding to the left and the right because of the scale two effect, the left or right motion path is offsetting the expansion so the left side of the smart shape is always in one place. Before we're done, I wanna cover two important things about the smart shape in the mask. The first is the width of the hole in the mask should be smaller than the size you want the smart shape to be. Even though my smart shape becomes 600 pixels wide, there is a slight jump at the end of the effect because the smart shape starts at six pixels wide and the middle of the smart shape is over just a few pixels to the left of the hole. So as the smart shape expands and moves to the right, the last few frames of the effect cause the smart shape to jump slightly because it's adjusting for the starting size and position of the smart shape. You can see the jump as I drag the playhead at the very end of the effect's duration. The left side of the smart shape stays in place for the entire duration of the effect, except for the last two frames where it moves to the right. Because of this jump is why I recommend setting the hole in the mask to something less than the width of the smart shape. Since the smart shape is becoming 600 pixels wide, I've created the hole in this mask to be 590 pixels wide. The second thing is that if you're going to publish your project to HTML5, you must change the effect start time from zero to 0 0.1 seconds for the scale to and left to right motion path effects. There is a bug with the scale to effect when you view the published project in Google Chrome if the effect start is set to zero seconds. 
What you see on screen right now is a published project to demonstrate how the bug appears. The red and green shapes inside the yellow box only have the scale 2 effect applied. The scale X is set to 100 and the scale Y is set to 1. The top two red and green shapes are 4 pixels wide, so they'll scale out to 400 pixels. The middle two are 6 pixels wide, so they'll scale out to 600 pixels. And the bottom two are 8 pixels wide, so they'll scale out to 800 pixels. When they're finished scaling, the top two should be the same width as the yellow box, the middle two the same width as the blue box, and the bottom two the same width as the purple box. The difference between the red and green shapes is that the effect start is set to 0 for the red shapes, and the effect start is set to 0.1 for the green shapes. We're currently in Firefox, so I'm going to press play, and you can see that the red shapes are a few pixels ahead of the green shapes, but that's only because they started 0.1 seconds sooner. However, when the end of the timeline is reached, all sets of shapes are exactly the same width as they should be. Going into Google Chrome, we see the same file, but pressing the play button reveals the bug. The red shapes are expanding further out to the right than the green shapes are, while the left sides of each group are keeping pace like they did in Firefox. At the end of the timeline, the red shapes are now extended further out to the right than they should be. Not only would this result in the timeline hitting the end sooner than it should, but it could also result in the smart shape extending out from under the mask on the right side as well, thus ruining the appearance. As you can see with the green shapes, by just changing the effect start to 0.1 seconds, it prevents the bug from occurring in Chrome. Now there are only a few things left to do. The first is to move the smart shape behind the mask. And then I'm going to take care of the space to the left and right of the mask. Because the mask can't be the full width of the slide because of the buttons on the master slide, we need to place a mask extension on the master slide. Go into the master slide. Now we're already on lower mask. I'm gonna go into my library drag out my mask background, and then place it at the bottom of the slide. Now I'm going to send it to the back. I'm going to drag it down so it's behind the two buttons. And coming back to the film strip, scroll down. We can see that that looks great. I'm going to press Control 4, and then scroll down to where the mask is. Click on that, and you can see that since the mask extension uses the same gradient as the mask does, it creates a seamless transition between the two, so it makes the appearance that there is no difference between the mask and the background behind it. I'm going to hit Control 1 to zoom back out, scroll down a little bit, and now I can drag out the playhead. And this mimics how the default Captivate play bar appears. When that mask expansion hits the end of the effect, it's where the pause is at, and it works. Now I can show you how this project appears when it's published. Here we are on our finished project. Pressing play, the circle moves from the left to the right. Next button appears, pauses where the next button pauses, and the circle's at the end of the slide. So I'm going to press next to go to the next slide, and here we have the same kind of a setup, only this one is with the monkey head sliding instead of a circle. Clicking next, we have the smart shape sliding behind a mask. Clicking next again, same thing, but this time with an image sliding over. And then finally on the last slide, we have the expanding smart shape sliding behind a mask with both buttons on both sides of the mask. And that is how to build per slide progress bars in Adobe Captivate. I'm Michael with Monkey Logic Design, and until next time, keep looking for ideas to take your creativity further.